Um, I feel like a slight imposter. This is, this is not my normal habitat. Uh, but I'm here for Art and Christianity. My name is Laura Moffat. I'm the director of Art and Christianity. And we've been lucky enough to be working alongside Berwick Church, uh, the Reverend Peter Blee and Helen Ellis here to put on this event today. Thank you to those that travelled a long way. I know some people have come an awful long way. But also thank you to you um, who are more local for joining us this evening. The more local people will probably have heard from the grapevine. Peter is unable to join us today as he's uh, tested positive for COVID just recently. So very, very sad that Peter's not here. He's watching on YouTube live. So hello, Peter. Uh, we're sending all our love and healing thoughts over to you in the parsonage just over there. Uh, and he's um, wanted us to say that he's, he's with us in spirit as well. So this event marks the culmination of a major restoration of the church. Um, for anybody who came before the conservation of the mur murals, I'm um, told on good authority they were a lot duller, the colours were a lot duller, and they're looking absolutely brilliant this evening, I think, in this, in this beautiful light. Uh, we've also, uh, I can, you know, we've got the new floor, there's the whole pew saga, I won't go into that, uh, that and wonderful technology, which means that we're, we're in a very good place to hold this series of events right through the weekend. We've joined as partners, we're a, a national organisation that promotes the, um, the dialogue, the exploration between visual arts and Christianity and religion more broadly. We produce a quarterly magazine, which I'm clutching here, and there are copies around for you to pick up uh, as you wish. Um, we put on lectures and events like this, and we also work alongside artists and churches, helping to um, commission new works of art and to raise standards and understanding of best practice in that field. But today's talk is um, really focusing on our theme of art, faith, and the natural environment. And it's one that's, um, well, having been postponed from last year, it's, it's actually marking for us the culmination of a, an extensive program of talks and lectures on the theme of Holy Ground. Many of those are available on our YouTube um, channel if you want to have a look at those. We've also been working uh, with a community in East London on a, a Holy Ground themed project where artists have worked alongside a Christian and a Hindu um, congregation. Uh, and the film from that project is what we're going to be showing tomorrow evening if you're here for that. So it seems very fitting that we're here in this absolutely idyllic corner of, of Sussex with views through the windows to the landscape and surrounded by these murals which so clearly reference the natural beauty of this place, albeit of 80 years ago. But while we'll be looking back uh, this evening at, at some of those, um, those paintings when we hear from Francis in a moment, uh, the impetus I think that's driving this is obviously the present climate emergency that we're in. Um, and we'll be asking over the course of the weekend how it is that our faith can influence our relationship to the natural world. In what ways pilgrimage and other rituals that focus on the natural environment can help to restore us to a more responsible and I would suggest also a more responsive um, attitude amongst people of faith. So I think if I may, I would also just like to say a very quick thank you to Peter and to Helen who've worked extremely hard on this. Helen particularly, there is Helen disappeared, but I'm going to tell her that I thanked her publicly um, in a minute. Helen's been absolutely brilliant, and it's down to her that we've got supper laid on and wine and all that. So thank you, Helen. Um, do come and talk to me later if you want to find out more about art and Christianity. We always welcome new members as well, so it'd be lovely, lovely to speak to you. So I'm going to now introduce Francis, Francis Spaulding, who is one of our most distinguished art historians in the 20th century British art. She's also a biographer, and she's written biographies of Vanessa Bell, Duncan Grant, um, of the poet Stevie Smith, and the artist Gwen Reverat, uh, and also of the Pipers, John and Nathaniel Piper. Uh, she teaches, and she's also the chair of Art and Christianity's Board of Trustees, and as such, she's also contributed um, a lot to 
some of the more recent initiatives uh, in dialogues between theology and the arts. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome everyone and thank you all for coming and thank you Laura for that introduction. It's very, very sad not to have Peter Blee with us, Reverend Peter Blee with us, vicar of this church, because um, the first person to write about these murals was someone called Richard Schoen, an art historian, um, and he was the first to put on record certain facts about how they were painted and what happened. But it's, this is the only book, I think, on, uh, on the actual murals by Peter himself obviously written over a great many, um, a long period of time, I should think, because it's very, very informative. But it's also immensely insightful into certain aspects of the uh, frescoes and, and their possible meaning or, or resonance with us. Um, fascinating, full of facts, much more, I'm afraid, than I can, than there will be today. It's going to be fairly, a bit of a run through. But I'm very sorry not to have him here. Um, in his introduction to this book, Peter Blee, uh, the, the book which says, I didn't give you the title, The Bloomsbury Group in Berwick Church. And what he says in that introduction is that what we see around us is the greatest surviving collaborative work between Duncan Grant and Vanessa Bell. Now, given that they both worked at the Omega workshops during the First World War with Roger Fry and were very experienced at making decorations for um, the tops of tables or for cupboards, or anything that had a surface that could receive a decoration, it was made or it could be made at the uh, Omega workshops and sold. And so they were very much immersed during the war for a period of time with decorative work. Fry, who had set them up, believed that the excitement caused by post-impressionism, that sudden release of uh, energy, through colour and rhythm and design and so on, could spill over outside the frame of the painting and enliven in, in our, um, our lives in other ways through the decorative arts. But it was Peter, I think, Peter Blee who makes this claim that of all the subsequent decorative ventures, two of which I'll show you later, that Duncan Grant and Vanessa uh, Bell... Can I have the first slide, please? Oh, I do it myself today, sorry. <laughs> Nothing seems to be happening. Oh, is it? Good. Oh, well, I have to do a password. Don't I? Sorry, we should have done this before. Password is incorrect. Oh, not so easy when you have to look up there to get things right. Okay. And now I go to... Uh, slideshow, didn't I? Yes. Okay. Good. So, um, I've got a photograph of both Vanessa Bell and Duncan Grant, and as I say, they did a great many decorative schemes for various individuals and houses and places, but, um, so it's quite a big claim to make by Reverend Blee to say that this was our, is, is the greatest surviving example of their work together. However, he said that when this book came out in 2016, and since then, Nick Sirota, Nicholas Sirota, the former director of Tate, has come up with a similar view. He says that it's, uh, this, this church with the decorations in it is nationally and internationally important, owing, as he says, because it is critically the... Um, only example in the country of a complete decoration of the interior of an ancient rural parish church by 20th century artists of some repute. And he said that in 2018. So it's taken a long time for this church and these decorations to receive that kind of accolade. Um, there been a lot of sort of uh, different remarks and so on over, over the years, and we might consider why, why that is. But one thing I want us to notice right at the start is that these decorations, in relation to their previous work, are a retreat um, to a method of representation um, that precedes post-impressionism. And this by two artists who famously helped promote a modernist approach in London um, to the making of art. 
um, after their friend and associate Roger Fry had mounted his two post-impressionist exhibitions bringing works of art from France to London in 1910 and 1912. Um, after those two exhibitions, English art experienced an outburst of radicalism and to which Bell and Grant, that's Vanessa Bell, significantly contributed. So one of the things we might think about this afternoon is why did they choose this style, this kind of uh, naturalistic realism for this church? And I suppose another issue that might be to the fore in our heads this afternoon is whether or not an artist needs to be a person of faith to undertake a commission for a sacred building. And again, this is something that Peter B. Blee addresses in his book. He goes so far as to suggest that a person lacking a personally developed spirituality and engagement with Christian faith may be in danger of producing work that is uncertain and lacks conviction. Well, Father Couturier, the, the French Dominican friar and lead figure in the Art Sacre movement in France, thought differently. Better geniuses without faith, he said, than believers without talent. <laughs> well, these are two conflicting views which we may want to discuss at some point, but certainly perhaps keep them in mind. I, what I'm going to give you this afternoon is a very condensed history of the making of these two of these wall decorations, um, after which I will, uh, I will weave into it slightly a, a passing reminder. Oops, have I? Sorry, moved on too soon. Yes, sorry, here we are again. Um, I'm going to weave in a passing reminder of just how wonderful uh, Italian fresco schemes can be, schemes that Duncan Grant particularly greatly admired. And then I'm going to touch on the rootedness of the agnosticism in Vanessa Bell's background, and then look at two decorative schemes that Doug Bell and Grant did, which preceded this work here at Edinburgh Church. Partly because I want to bring out the contrast between the style they chose to use here and ones that they'd used in the past. Now this is the gentleman who got the ball rolling. This man was Professor Charles Riley, and between 1904 and 1933, he headed up the Liverpool School of Architecture, having enormous influence, partly as a teacher, but also with his views on planning and all kinds of things. Um, the School of Architecture at Liverpool became um, renowned, it was a sort of world leader, and he was enormously influential. But when he retired, he took a house in Brighton and he went to see a wall painting recently completed by Hans Feibusch in a newly built church, St. Wilfrid in Brighton. Um, and afterwards, he, I have to say, he wrote a letter to George Bell, then Bishop of Chichester, and no relation to Vanessa Bell. And his letter praises what he had seen as, I quote him, a painting belonging to the current generation and based in its forms and colors on the revolutions in the graphic arts brought about by the researches and experiments of Cezanne and Picasso. This work, he went on, is both modern and universal, as is all the best modern art. Well, it seems that this letter greatly encouraged uh, George Bell, Bishop Bell, in his already determined determination to try to take steps to engage contemporary art, to engage contemporary artists in work for the church. There followed an, uh, an exhibition and various projects, um, partly because Bell was very aware in the 1940s, the early years of the war, that many parish churches during the first half of the 20th century, or the first part of it, had not been touched. Um, we know, all know that there was a huge amount of church building in the 19th century, particularly the late 19th century and so on, for various reasons. But it stopped with the 20th century, for what reason I'm not quite sure. And these churches, particularly rural churches, became very static and unchanging. And he was worried by this. He was aware of this stasis. And so he wrote an article for the uh, Studio magazine in 1942. And in it, as you can see here, he said, ancient churches cannot, in fact, be preserved if they are regarded as ancient records. They must serve a living purpose. And in doing so, necessary changes must be introduced. Why should not the present age also make its contribution? 
is it not essential that it should do so? Well, by this time, 1942, Duncan Grant had been asked to go and meet with George Bell in Brighton. And the suggestion had been made that Duncan Grant should himself decorate a Sussex church. He told Bell that he lived in a house with three other people and that they were all artists, Vanessa, Quentin and Angelica Bell. And all three perhaps might have a hand in the decoration of a church with himself acting as director of works. And it was agreed that a scheme should be drawn up for the bishop's approval. Now in 1939, Duncan Grant had been a founder member of the Society of the British Mural Painters and he had supported its first exhibition titled Mural Painting in Great Britain, 1919 to 1939. I think it was held in the Tate. He and Vanessa were represented in it by some of the photographs on display. Now the church selected is of course the one that we, we are in, Berwick, and as you can see it's quite a small church and at the time in 1940 it was completely sort of unadorned. It had a plainness and simplicity which I think made uh, Duncan and Vanessa aware that they should avoid um, mannerism or any sort of clever conceits in the decorations they produced. Nevertheless, one thing that Duncan brought to this ta task was an intense awareness of how immersive wall decorations can be when they are part of an overall conception. And I cannot but resist showing you the very well-known um, um, chapel in Padua, the Arena or Scrovegni Chapel as it's called, which of course was uh, decorated um, entirely by Giotto, one of the most famous buildings in the history of the early Renaissance. And it is, of course, a wonderful building. There are three windows on one side which let in the light. And when you get inside, I think you probably have to queue for a long time these days, what you have to do is to stand there and gradually spiral around because, first of all, the story of Joachim and Anna, the parents of the Virgin, fill the top register and then gradually in the next two becomes the story of Christ's life and passion. Uh, but you can see how utterly immersive an experience of this building is. It, it's, I can't resist but show you one in detail. This is the very first scene in which Joachim has gone to the temple to sacrifice a lamb and make his obeisance to God. And because his wife has no child, she's barren, he's uh, not allowed to do so and he's turned away by a priest. You see how cleverly Giotto suggests the temple solely by showing the pulpit um, and, the, um, and the altar under a sort of baldacchino thing. And you can just see over the wall that a man is being blessed, a younger man having um, presumably had a child and brought his lamb for sacrifice. I just want you to look at the way the other priest has not only got his hand on um, Joachim's back to push him away, but he's even tugging at his robe to say, off you go, off you go, and so on. And where is he standing? Well, like all uh, um, series in the, in the East Enders, he's standing on a cliff edge. Mm -hmm. So we know that there's more of the story to come. As a young man, Duncan Grant spent a period in Florence, and he never forgot um, the impression made on him by the Brancacci Chapel. This is about 100 years later, with, with um, um, murals by Masaccio and Massolino. And what he loved about this particular uh, thing was, again, this kind of immersive experience of standing in the heart of something, of a narrative of a set of paintings and drawings and paintings and things. But he particularly liked the simplicity of concept in each picture and the use of emotive gesture. And if we look at perhaps the most famous one in it, the famous tribute money, where Masaccio uses an old-fashioned style of storytelling, which is a sort of three-in-one narrative. So at the very centre, you see Christ with his rather Greek-like perfect uh, features. Uh, he's been confronted by the uh, centurion to pay taxes, and he indicates with his arm that they can be found in a fish's mouth to Peter, the grey-haired, grey-bearded man just to his uh, left who points where he will go, and the next thing we see, if we move across to the left here, is that Peter is kneeling down to take the coins out of the fish's mouth. And on the far right, you'll see it's again Peter, still in his gold and blue clothes, 
giving the money to the tax collector. But what a lovely, the way these very definite gestures, particularly that one as he hands to the tax collector the money that is owed. This, uh, this ability to swing you through a narrative, to, to, to gain um, movement through a scene is something perhaps that interested uh, Duncan. It is, of course, also famous for its aerial perspective, one of the earliest examples of that, and therefore, um, in, in many other ways, truly admirable. But of course, the other thing that Duncan uh, did in, in Florence was to begin his lifelong admiration of Piero della Francesca, and uh, later in his life, of course, he had the great opportunity to see uh, Piero's great frescoes of the legend of the Holy Cross at Arezzo. And here we see the, the final scene, I think, when the the Holy Cross is discovered. Um, so, with these sort of things back in their mind, this is what, when they came into this uh, uh, small building, um, nevertheless, there was an attempt to have something that would have that same capacity to embrace. Well, let's have a look at the church itself. It's, as, you, as we know, um, a very rather typical Sussex church with its, uh, with its um, spire and uh, everything. Um, it's actually supposed to be date back to the 12th century in part, then I'm not sure what to tell you where that is, but if there's someone in the audience, do please let us know. Um, a tower was added in 1603, and the interior altered and enlarged in 1856, as I think we can see on the side um, on, um, naves. I think the font is the oldest thing to that. That's the oldest thing, is it? Ah, yes, good. Um, uh, even at that date in 1856, the parish was still poor and illiterate, for over the centuries it had served just the kind of farm labourers that Vanessa Bell was to put into her uh, nativity scene on the right here. When its spire was hit by lightning in 1779, three of its four bells had to be sold in order to pay for its repair. Inevitably, this project had to pass through a range of ecclesiastical hoops before it was fully approved. Um, initially, the plan was just to concentrate on the chancel arch above me here and on the two side walls, so Christ in glory and the Annunciation and the Nativity. Inevitably, studies had to be made and sketches and so on to show to the parish church council. And here is one that is found in the... Um, found in the uh, attic in, at Charleston, an early study, not the first study, this is a second or third along study for the um, uh, Annunciation that we see here. It's currently on show at Philip Moles Gallery in Pall Mall in London in an exhibition titled The Bloomsbury Group, in which a number of works from Charleston have been lent, partly to draw attention to Charleston and to help it gain uh, back the position it had before lockdown. I thought as we look at it in the, on the screen here, um, we, we might just compare it with what actually happens. In the earlier version of this uh, study, you see the, the Ouse Valley behind and a sense of it being the church being placed in this wonderful uh, position. But in the final, as, as you can see here, she's already changed her mind and thought, no, it would be more appropriate to have the quietness of a garden than a walled garden. And so you can see that, and some trees are flourishing. But if I show you, if we look at the uh, finished one, um, you'll notice that the trees have gone, and that uh, wall with the vertical beam creates a sort of cross-like shape within the, within the composition. And the handling of the angel's wings is much better designed. I notice also it's more distinctive, this half-rising or half kneeling movement, as if to emphasize that Mary has just had this sudden uh, news and responding to it in this way. Rather beautiful uh, management of pose to express her um, obedience to what she's been told. And always Vanessa Bell wanted this wonderful outburst of lilies in that closed bit at the bottom. And you may just notice under the lilies this, this uh, which you can see also in the study here. They loved it in Italy when they found I forget what it's properly called. Is it scagliare? Yes? <laughs> Is that the right term? For imitation marbling? 
<laughs> they were very fond of that. So, so whenever they could, as you'll see later on, they reverted to it. Um, so it's fascinating, because you'll also notice in this study here there are curtains indicated in the two sides, even the far side is a bit in shadow. And, of course, that was got rid of, and instead you have the simplicity of a bare room, partly because on the at a late stage they decided to have these two magnificent roundels for windows uh, with a sense, initially there was thought to be foliage and things showing through them, but how much more effective it was to have um, just sky and the sense of the, the world outside through, through that decision. Well, as I say, it had to pass through these ecclesiastical hoops and uh, when these sketches and studies were shown to the parish church council, it voted seven to one to apply for a faculty in May 1941. By Jul July, the scheme had been passed by the church advisory committee, and during the first week of August, the bishop rang to tell Duncan Grant that the chancellor of the diocese had granted a faculty. After this work could begin in earnest, an advice was sought from the architect Frederick Etchells. He pointed out that the rather amateur, amateurish 1856 extension had left few of the church's old features in their original place, their original position, and therefore the decorations would not interfere with the authenticity of the building. He also recommended that the artists should not paint directly on the walls, but on plasterboard panels, a method also used largely by Stanley Spencer in his decoration of the Sandon Memorial at Berkeley. I'll just show you a slide of that later for a comparison with this. Much of the work, of course, therefore, was not done in the church, but in the barn at Charleston. And models were found among local people. Um, the shepherd on the Furl Estates stood in for his counterpart with a crook um, in, in the nativity on the right. And um, these young soldier son of the Berwick station master, I can't quite see, is uh, one of these three servicemen down the left-hand side of the Christ in glory. And of course, as you probably know, George Bell, and is it George Mitchell, the name of the vicar at the time? Yes, are shown <laughs> over there. Um, um, so this young soldier stood in, son of the Berwick station master, he stood in as one of the representatives of the armed forces. And so they're responding, of course, very much to the moment in which these, uh, in which these, these decorations were made. Now, I don't want to get mired down in the detail that went on between that point and the final um, uh, consecration of these meals, but there was, of course, problems, as you may know, and, uh, and uh, people began to be worried about um, what was happening. They realized that you know, the things were coming. Duncan Grant was going to portray the four seasons in roundels on the front of the screen here. And behind, one of my most favorite bits are Quentin Bell's uh, roundels of the uh, paintings, not roundels, but um, of the sacraments. And if you haven't ever seen them, do come and look at them after this talk because they're, they're very attractive. Quentin Bell's father was Clive Bell, who banged on an awful lot about significant form. He wrote a book called Art, published in 1915, and everyone after that talked about the importance of significant form. Um, and what that meant was that it didn't matter what you were painting, what the subject was, that was totally irrelevant. All that mattered was that the satisfactory uh, nature of the work was due to its significant form. Well, these pictures by Quentin behind this wall are a complete protest at what his father was saying, because they're all about narrative, detail, Victorian sort of love of activity and so on, and um, maybe, maybe not so good on significant form. So the other person um, who also helped at that time was Angelica. I had thought that she didn't do anything, but from Peter's book I learned that she did an initial take on the... Uh, um, pulpit. Now, uh, this is the, uh, oh, sorry, that's just a picture to show you um, what the fine mark, um, and a lovely sense of airy sunlight and things coming in here. I think this photograph must be one that's been taken since the works have been cleaned, um, but I can't be absolutely sure that it looks so good. It is, is it? Not this one, no, yes, no, if you can see the battered state that they were in. Perhaps that's quite a good thing to show mm -hmm. people, to demonstrate how much good work has been done. 
Um, yes. Um, but everybody sort of who was around somehow contributed in some way. And um, one of Angelica's friends was called Chatty Salomon, and she duly wrapped herself in towels and things mm -hmm. and knelt on a very heavy encyclopedia in armchairs so that Duncan could get this sense of floating angels around Christ in the top of the, um, of the scene here. Um, I was, as I was talking about the pulpit, um, I just want to mention that it's just the only one that was ever been subjected to any form of vandalism. Um, and it was repainted by uh, Duncan and Angelica, I think, later on. I've got another slide of it, but it's, it's uh, I think, a very successful part of the overall decorations. So with all this uh, uh, so slightly mounting anxiety as what was happening to their church, um, there was a particularly um, a vociferous person who, who ran the jam-making society, which <laughs> was a very convenient form of meeting over which you could discuss what you were aggrieved about or so on. And uh, eventually they decided to put in a proper serious protest, which actually therefore was uh, um, caused Bishop Bell to uh, uh, realize that it would have to go to a consistory court. But before it went, he called a meeting of the parishioners in some house or barn, I'm not quite sure where, which was a very clever thing to do because everyone was able to voice what they were feeling at that stage and uh, get get it out. And the following day at the consistory court, Mrs. Sanderland's objections, which Vanessa Bell was dreading, what might she say, um, um, simply was that Quentin was not a conscientious objector, he, um, as he said. And uh, Quentin had never said he was a conscientious objector. He had TB. He was not allowed to fight in the war. And it wasn't because of his uh, uh, decision to be a conscientious objector. So everything crumbled and it went ahead without any, any problems. And of course, um, Glenneth Clark by that time had been brought in and everybody had their eyes on this little church as to what would happen. It's sort of, you know, would it get through, would it not get through? But it has got through and as we know, it's now widely um, praised and enjoyed. Um, I want to now just talk a little bit about, as I've mentioned, the um, agnosticism in... Uh, in Vanessa Bell's family, because I think in her case, um, um, it is quite, a, it's a, quite an important thing to think about. Her father, Leslie Stephen, had initially gone up to Tr Trinity College, Cambridge. He'd accepted a fellowship that committed him to taking religious orders. That was quite common in the colleges at that time, and which he had done, but he then began to doubt the Christian religion. He wrote, when I accept, cease to accept teaching the, the teaching of my youth, it was not so much a process of giving up beliefs as of discovering that I had never really believed them. And then I've given you the next bit. The contrast between the genuine convictions that guide and govern our conduct and the professions which we are taught to repeat in church, when once realized, was too glaring. One belonged to the world of realities, the other to the world of dreams. He was a man very interested in philosophy and in the British empiricists, John Stuart Mill and Thomas Hobbes. And they, I think, played a part in his move towards agnosticism. It started when he found himself unable to declaim the story of the flood and Noah's Ark as if it were sacred truth. And finding himself unable to take part in college services, he had to resign his tutorship at the master's request. But he was allowed to retain his fellowship and he stayed on for another couple of years fulfilling minor duties, but then decided to make literature his profession and move to London. And before long, he was pouring out journalism and books, among them a book called Essays on Free Thinking and Plain Speaking, published 1873. And in that, you find the case for his, for his agnosticism. And he, his thoughts on it came to the attention of a young wood widow called Julia Duckworth, who was to become his second wife, because his text did much to confirm her in her own thoughts on matters of religion. So Vanessa Bell grew up in a home, really, where um, there was not no real um, possibility of church having a, a, a place. It wasn't that it was denied or denigrated, it just wasn't mentioned. 
just wasn't, and they never went to church. So when they got to school and heard a teacher explaining that Good Friday was good because it was on the day on which Christ died, they burst into giggles, not understanding at all what the whole thing was about. And um, I think that it's, it's uh, something that has to be recognised as, as uh, not a deliberate dislike and deliberate uh, fighting against, but just the decision that it wasn't part of their life at all. A friend of mine wrote a novel called Vanessa in Virginia, which has done extremely well and is very, in many ways a, a lovely novel, but she has them both, the, both sisters get married in church. They never went inside a church until they were started going to funerals in old age. So uh, we have to remember that as her background. And I think... Um, the, the impressiveness of these two parents, Julia and um, Leslie Stephen, you can see is expressed in Virginia, their daughter's, their, their young, younger daughter's face, as she sits in the background there watching them read. One, once when this photograph was used in the book, they thought how very odd and took Virginia's face out. But of course, it's, it's terribly relevant to what is going on in that particular scene. The other thing to say about this family, it was very, very loud, noisy and rumbustious and every year they uh, took a train to, um, to Cornwall to have holidays. Uh, Leslie Stephen thought it would be good for children brought up in London to have several months a year living near the seaside in good air and with the freedom of the beach near at hand. And so they would jump on the train with servants and dogs and trunks and everything and... Uh, um, um, settle into the talent house which he took a lease on on what he called the toenail of Britain um, and when Henry James came to visit because he was very fond of Julia Stephen um, they made such a racket and noise he couldn't bear it and went in search of alternative accommodation the following day but the other thing to say of course is that while this all was going on that Vanessa Stephen as she then was was beginning to want to become a painter and here she is being watched by her three um, three siblings, Virginia, Toby and Adrian. So let's move on now and see what, just look at a couple of um, decorative commissions they did before they turned to Berwick. And the one I want to look at is uh, what they did for Maynard Keynes. Immediately after the success of his book, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, published in 1918, very soon after um, the Treaty of Versailles, um, and he, he predicted, of course, that the situation that left the, these countries as they were um, would cause enormous problems later on, and, of course, his thesis was proved to be correct. He had gone back to Cambridge, and he was offered some rather splendid rooms in King's College, and he wanted to have a set of figures down one side of the wall, four down one side and four down uh, the other side of the door in the same wall. So it was a run of eight figures, and he vaguely had the idea that it should, they, these figures should represent the sciences and the humanities. It's not immediately obvious which of these figures represents what, but this was nevertheless the intention. And these were the studies that he created to show Maynard Keynes as to what these, they would look like in the room. And um, um, here you see the skag, skagliari, which we see a little bit of underneath the, the flowers there, and some sort of kind of equivalent mottling of the wall on over there. The, uh, they did require that an earlier set of murals had to be covered over, an earlier mural by Duncan Grant of harvesters who were dancing, and it's thought that they, they were covered up as they were fairly naked um, dancing around. But in fact, uh, although you see here the three men have got discreetly got loincloths, these were removed in the final paintings. So actually, I don't think there was any sort of real serious uh, worry about um, content in either case because these were Maynard Keynes' rooms and he was so successful by this time that he could really have what he wanted. What I do want you to notice in seeing what the actual finished figures look like is how they are embedded into the room by the use of this colouring of the panelling about around them. Uh, the Duncan and Grant and Vanessa Bell chose this kind of egg eggshell blue with maroon to create this environment in which these figures nestle and contribute to the sort of um, feeling and environment of, of the whole room. This, of course, is after Maynard Keynes had gone 
hence that rather interim bookcase at the bottom with rather modern books. But the uh, window that you just see on the left here is a lovely big arched window and Vanessa Bell designed a huge uh, curtain with appliqued shapes in it. Um, nevertheless, uh, King's College today is a little bit more prudish than it was in the, in the 20th century and they got worried by these uh, designs and quite a lot of the fellows didn't like them. They were getting into rather bad state so they sent them off to the Hamilton Carr Institute. They've been wonderfully cleaned and you can see they put them all together into a room to try and make them look impressive and, and respectable. But indeed, I think they lose that kind of playfulness and intimacy that you would have seen when they were <coughs> in situ in Maynard's room. <coughs> now, the funny thing is that whenever they, uh, after the success of these murals, because Maynard was very pleased with them, they produced a Christmas card, hand-painted, in which they sent out at Christmas 1922. And as you can see, it says, Vanessa Bell, Duncan Grant, decorations, domestic, ecclesiastical, theatrical. So al already by then, they recognized that the habit of producing wall decorations for churches was something that the, perhaps they too could be involved in and wanted to, to be involved with. Um, in, in the mid-20s, about 24, 25, uh, Virginia Woolf had been taken off to Richmond to make her more healthy. She'd had a very severe breakdown during the First World War. Um, was allowed back to the centre of London by her husband, Leonard. And they took a house in Tavertock Square. And here you can see the, the Virginia Woolf deliberately said before she moved in, I want you to decorate our sitting room. And you can see that it's quite as severe. They're all paintings to do with sort of musical instruments and things like that. But it's quite severe, and uh, apart from the dado above, which again has this scagliari, scagliari patterning to give it sort of animation. But what I'm trying to say is that I think they changed their style according to the person who was commissioning the work from them. They didn't have a personal style which they inflicted on their clients. They knew their clients, they talked to them, and they devised uh, decorations in accordance with who they were working for. And um, here is the uh, um, beautiful, um, uh, a lovely slide of this uh, pulpit, which we have here. But as I say, it's the second time round. There was a second stage to these murals, which uh, produced the Christ and the crucifixion on the, cr the cross behind us here, and other things. And what Duncan Grant realized when, um, when they first were all completed was that it still needed linking into the building. And so he asked permission to paint these bands of uh, orange and pink at the top of the pillars and around the screen, to have it around the screen, have this decorative uh, key pattern that's rather like what they do at um, Charleston fireplaces, to, to blend the works of art, the paintings, in with the architecture as the whole. What today I find surprisingly missing is, of course, what was the shock for me today was to come in and find it without the heaviness and the weight of the dark pews, which used to be on either side. And though this is a bad slide um, in terms of focus, it gives you a sense of what was there beforehand. But um, as Bishop Bell said, churches are living things and they have moved organically through the centuries. And for this reason, there may be very good things that can go on in the more spacious um, use of this building that the alterations has permitted. But I do at the moment sense a lack of something weighty to hold them down, to, to talk to these, these decorations in a way that balances them so that uh, there's a meeting of the ground with the, what's happening above. I hope that you will take the opportunity between now and the next talk just to walk around and certainly come and investigate the the virgins up at the top inside this chancel arch here, those who were prepared and those who were unprepared, um, and also to see the new um, painting by Julian Bell, which has formed a reredos, having uncovered those arches. They uncovered them by moving Quentin Bell's Supper at Emmaus away from the back of the altar. It was acting like a reredos, and with permission from the... Uh, um, Chancellor, they put it just on the down in that corner there. And you will see there again a reference to the landscape in which we're sitting in, because Furl Beacon is visible in the background behind the 
the uh, what is going on. This love of the environment, this love of the uh, um, the situation with the, the countryside, everything around this church, I think, does creep into this work in various ways. And it's also what I want. I want to finally end up by saying that I think it is a non-coercive aesthetic. Now, that's not bad. It's a, it, a non-coercive doesn't mean it's not trying to communicate, to give uh, some shape to things, to convey meaning. But it's not something like a piece of propaganda that tries to coerce you into um, uh, whatever. It's a non-coercive aesthetic. And I think that when one comes in here after a day of perhaps walking nearby or something and just sits down for a little bit and experiences it, it does actually have this capacity to affect and change your mood or sense of where you are and so on. And that's part of what I think is so successful about them. But, but I'll just end up by showing you the, uh, um, the slide and one more. The, uh, a famous chapel at Berkeley, which perhaps many of you may have seen, by Stanley Spencer, painted in the 1920s, the late 1920s. And uh, he has a similar idea to Duncan and Vanessa in that in these lunettes on either side, um, he put, put, portrays along the bottom lunettes, the uh, ones in the bottom register, represent his experiences as a medical um, orderly in a hospital in, in Bristol, Beaufort Hospital, and all the tasks he had to do um, every day in that position. And the ones above record his memories of being a soldier. He was sent out eventually to Macedonia. And then in that end wall that you see here, we have an extraordinary um, um, kind of um, um, resurrection, it's called. And that the, uh, this great muddle of white crosses, which were the sort of standard cross, weren't they, used in graves for um, um, soldiers. And they're getting up out of them, and they're, some of them in the foreground are leaning across and shaking hands. Some are unrolling their putties, part of their uniform. You see these two mules in the middle with a cross between them, and their heads are twisting round because he want, they direct you further up. And I don't know if you can just see at the very top, there's a tiny little pale figure um, to which certain soldiers are giving back their crosses rather like they had to give back their equipment and, uh, as a soldier. And it is, it is an extraordinary ex, uh, in, insight into what a res resurrection just might be like, I think, this giving back. In the case of the soldiers, with all the grimness that they had to face fighting and the bayoneting and some, probably having to actually kill someone from a face-to-face -face battle, they were giving up back uh, the bloody mess of their lives, of course. But all this is somehow conveyed in a peaceful and uh, relatively sort of uh, happy landscape, as it were. It's an extraordinary work, very, very unusual, somewhat eccentric, but, but the greatness of it, I think, probably does exceed um, Berwick Church. But I think Berwick Church is doing something very different, and something of that is caught, perhaps best of all, in Vanessa Bell's Annunciation. Thank you very much. Uh, and now uh, thank you so much Francis it was really wonderful in uncovering so many details and, and um, drawing in things from the past and ideas of uh, I love the, the idea about the immersiveness of this of this space and to hear all of that in situ has just been Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions? Because there's time for questions. I wondered if uh, you were going to do that Dublin Grass thing at all, if you had any or... Yes, I didn't really do that, did I? Uh, I, I just, um, <laughs> well, I thought about what, what I should refer to as possibly being a formative influence on his spiritual life or whatever. The, the thing was that as a child, his father was in the army and not madly successful. And he was always being moved about and then sent home and made to live with his straight she cousins and so on. So it was a, and and the, the straight she cousins were unbelievably intellectual and sort of not quite, you know, they're, they're rather like the Stevens. They just didn't, church just didn't exist. So I think it was diff more difficult to say, but he was clearly, a, the, the, the readiness that he immediately accepted this task and the, the fact that he came and looked around and thought, mm, not finished, need something more. That's a perfectionist, somebody really thinking about the building how it's going to be used and the people within it and so on. And the way that they 
having lived at Charleston um, uh, on and off, I mean, they, they lived there during the First World War, they then kept it on as a kind of holiday home. They never owned it, it was leased, I mean, rented, you know. And, and then the Second World War, they settled there permanently again. So um, they were very, quite well known and uh, they'd had, you know, people were helping them and so on. So they were able to draw on people in this way readily. And uh, it, the understanding of the need to fill these spaces, the, um, Bishop Bell came to uh, um, pose and of course he couldn't give Duncan quite long enough as he wanted so he left his beautiful gown, coat and things and they had a model that they put it on. And as the best bell commented, we were all of a dither with Christianity. And they did read uh, their Bibles because they knew they had to for this, you see. So that, that was a new thing for them. And they, they got rather interested in it all, really. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask a question? Not having been in this church before, my question is, what was it like to be part of this commissioning of these paintings? Because what I'm absolutely struck by, and I don't think I've ever seen it before, is these clear glass windows and these church windows. Because most churches have some lattice or some sort of staining or something. Yes. So what's this part of this to highlight? Because it really throws the light up yes, into right. this church. It's yes. unusual. I don't okay. think I've ever seen a church like this before. I know that the windows were blown out in the wall. Well, that made it easy. Um, I don't know at what stage the painting was when that happened. Okay. I know the Battle of Britain was sort of going on overhead while they were yeah. painting. Um, um, I don't know if Ruth knows any more, but I, I know by the time they finished, the windows were clear, I think. I think it's 41 when they were blown out. That's actually the inspiration to have that clear glass. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. They, they didn't put the lid back in because they knew it could have happened again, you know, it could have yeah. again, and then they stayed. Because I suppose the wind at the back was the kind of level that would have perhaps been yeah. more, more, more common. This one was very modern at that time, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Yes. So how does it relate to the Lincoln Chapel? Because that's yeah. the other sort of big ecclesiastical yes. commission that Duncan had. Yes. Well, that was quite a bit later. I got to the 50s, I think, isn't it? Yes. And... Um, do you know, it's funny, but because it was locked away for so long, it's not, I think it's still not very well known. Um, well, the, um, there's a wonderful long, long scene showing a view of the, the docks, um, uh, Lincoln, and uh, I mean, and among the people standing on the shore is one of Olivia and, and Angelica, because they often put their own, you know, family into pictures and so on. The problem there was that there was um, a saint's head leaning out of Roundel over the door, looking towards the, uh, I forget which saint I'm afraid, looking towards the altar, which had his, Duncan Grant's boyfriend, Paul Roche, modelled for it, uh, Christ and his sheep, and there's a rather beautiful blonde-haired Christ with a, a sheep round his neck and others in the, in, around him. And... Um, he assumed it was a statement of on Duncan Grant's part of his deep devotion to Paul Roche. And so he thought this was unacceptable. So he closed the, ch the chapel. Is it, is it a chapel? Is it a the chapel. chapel, yes. And, and it was used as a sort of broom cupboard. <laughs> so it was a long time before that was put right, I think. And, uh, but I think it's, all, it's not sort of quite recovered from that, really. I don't know. Um, been some money a very nice thing. Yes. Yeah, um, I'm quite sure of the orientation of the church and I wanted if that had any relevance on where he was ah, placed. Would you like to say? Uh, sorry. Please 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 Yes, so it is the east-west orientation, isn't it? It's, uh, in, uh, as per usual. Yes. Good. Good. Yes. I'm really interested to see, um, you said there was an earlier uh, sketch, not sketch, that had the film back there. Yes. Um, and I was very struck by the fact that that is a complete contrast to the other painting, which all has sort of natural landscape. It seems to me to be referring back to sort of medieval models of the horses. Yes. Do you think that's a, a 
deliberate reference back, or do you think she just thought it would look better with the carved? I mean, is that given what you said about her sort of yeah. lack of um, church background in that sense? Do you think that's a deliberate reference back from anyone? I would. I wouldn't be at all surprised that she knew about the mortis conclusis. Uh, it, if people say, oh, well, it's Charleston garden, because there's a wall garden at Charleston, but it never had uh, rows of vegetables or whatever it is in that sort of way, in that sort of um, Italian way, sort of design way. So um, I think it probably does refer to that, yes. More specifically, so once you remove the, the trees that were in the middle of the, the study. Mm -hmm. I think they, they, they knew a thing or two, you know, because they had looked at art quite a lot. And so, uh, uh, does anyone else love these windows as I do? <laughs> There's a study, isn't there, one showing that they were initially going to show fronds of a tree behind, but they decided, no, let's just have the, the open air. And I do think there's the lilies which are touched with light all around the edge are, are an expression of something very quite profound, yes. And of course they're a symbol, aren't they, for the Virgin, so they yeah, stand up. Yes? This is quite a bit later. And it, uh, um, I think it was Edward Labar who posed for it, wasn't it? A, a friend of his. Um. <laughs> I mean, Peter is, writes wonderfully about it, but I've always, I, I don't know, I've always had a bit of a difficulty with it. He's been. Um, there's something. Uh, out of which I find difficult. Yeah. But it's certainly later than these uh, things here. So what I want to ask is, the, uh, is it all right to revert to a so fairly almost Victorian manner of painting in the 1940s for a church, as they have done here? I mean, I remember when I first walked in, I thought, you can't paint like this in the 20th century. But of course, as you get older and a bit more sympathetic to things, <laughs> Oh, yes, you can. <laughs> anyway, it's a personal subjective thing, isn't it? It's interesting that Nick Sorota is so fiercely praising of them. Um, he came out with that at the time that Bishop Bell was under question. Uh, unfortunately, he died by then, but it was, it was disproved, the allegations against Bishop Bell. I didn't particularly want to go into that today, but yeah. it's very, very unfortunate because Bishop Bell, of course, was the man who in the House of Lords, challenged the government's um, you know, carpet bombing of Germany and, and didn't think this should be allowed. And it's said that because of that, he lost the opportunity to become Archbishop of Canterbury. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, a bit of history. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you.